G'day, my name's Dave Pello, and welcome to another successful immigrant story. Um, today I'm sitting down with David Hodgson. Thanks for joining me, David. My pleasure, Dave. Good to catch up with you. I've met you once before, so. Now tell me, what country are you from? Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. I was yep. born in London, grew up in Zambia, okay, as, as, as my formative years, and then my parents moved to Zimbabwe, which was in those days called Rhodesia. So that's where I actually came from. Okay, from now Rhodesia. you um, very non-politically correctly um, describe yourself as a, a black, white child? Yes, up. that's right. Was that so, the right words you used? Yeah, yeah. I, I was a, a white black kid. A white black kid. Yeah, right. so a white skin, but internally, I mean, I was a black guy. I grew up with the black kids in Zambia yep. uh, um, in the 50s, and I never spoke English. My first language was Bemba or Chibemba, and I learned the bush, and I learned to track and to make string and to make traps and just lived off the bush, and I didn't really speak English until I got home at night to my parents. Wow. Now, you got sent to South Africa for your education. Yep. But when you went back to um, Zimbabwe, uh, you actually joined the army there. Yeah, correct. So when I was four years old, the independence movements were sweeping down south uh, from Central Africa through into Zambia and so on. My parents thought it was too dangerous for white kids to go to school there. So they stuck me on a train, sent me to the bottom tip of Africa. It's thousands of kilometres, 10 days each way on the train. Yeah, you would have passed through a number of countries. Yeah, four countries. Wow. And we, unescorted, okay, no parents, no nothing. And it was like January and we'll see you in June. So we grew wow. up without parents dealt with apartheid in South Africa because, remember, my in, I was a white black kid. I got my brains beaten out for talking to black kids down there. White kids wouldn't talk to me because I didn't know how to speak good English or Afrikaans. Um, mm. But eventually my parents moved from Zambia down to what was then Rhodesia. Now Did that toughen Zim you up, getting beaten up Absolutely. Up yeah, I learned, I learned to fight and learned to survive. We had to. Yep. Yeah, very quickly on those trains, you yep. get your brains beaten out. Right? Bullying, from my point of view, was actually, you know, it's a bad thing. It's a big topic these days, but it toughened me right up for, yeah. for, for a time like this, actually. Wow. Yeah. Now, when did you end up going to Zimbabwe and joining the army? So my parents moved to Zimbabwe, which in those days was called Rhodesia, in about 1964 or five-ish, I would mm -hmm. think. And uh, so they sent me to boarding school in Zimbabwe then, but of course, we had declared, uh, our neighbours had declared war on us at the time. Mm -hmm. So when I grew up during school years, there was a war going on, we were being invaded. And then when I left school, we were called up for two years at a time, but we were unemployable. So because you, when you left the army, you were, you were one min, month in, month out, month in, month out, nobody would employ you. You might as well stay in the army as a regular. So I joined the army and I joined the SAS, mostly because they, <laughs> they paid more. Okay, oh, good. I, I'm a natural entrepreneur and, and <laughs> I thought I'm going to make some money out of this war so I joined the SAS yep. and I fought with the SAS for four years uh, behind enemy lines mostly in, in the countries around us. And you up trained stuff. as a terrorist. Well, Does that mean they, the SAS trained you or you no. infiltrated the terrorist training camps? No, I, I did four years in the SAS mm -hmm. and then I left and joined another special forces called the Salu Scouts. Okay, and the Sulu Scouts were a pseudo-operational team. So we became terrorists. We were taught to become terrorists. So guys like me who grew up in the bush, who spoke fluent language and knew all the customs and everything else, we were trained to become terrorists. And we infiltrated their ranks and killed them from the inside. And when and what brought you to Queensland? Uh, we stayed in Perth for about five years, built business there, and eventually I sold the business because my brother was in Queensland. We went over to visit him up in far north Queensland, mm -hmm. loved the look of the bush. It was so different to the desert in Perth. Right, yeah. And he invited me to join him on an avocado venture, because wow. that's what he is, he's a horticulturalist. Okay. And so we decided to move over to far north Queensland in about 1989, I would say. Okay, and so your brother brought you over here? Well, we, we, yeah, so we went to far north Queensland, yeah. uh, Cairns, uh, Cairns, Atherton, Tablelands. Family's region. a good reason to move to another country. Yeah, that's when, right. When you're choosing and, and the other side of the country yeah. as well. Yeah, correct. So just briefly now, tell me about what you're doing now, what your vision is and, and your purpose is. Okay. Uh, keep in mind, we left the Atherton, Tablelands and moved here to the Sunshine Coast about 18 years ago, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I, I had noticed, of course, I, I watched in, uh, in Zimbabwe the collapse of the place. I, I, I was fully understood what Mugabe had done to the people. Whether you're black, white, or communist or not, corruption's corruption. And through corruption, he trashed the nation. He trashed his own people for his own self-centeredness and, 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 
and put everybody in poverty and starvation, trashed the, the breadbasket of Africa. Mm. So I thought, wow, we're going to live in Australia. And when I looked around at Australia, I realized the same corruption uh, was here as well, albeit more sophisticated and covert. But we had a lot of corruption here. And I thought, can you give an example of that? Because that's pretty hard to hear that well, look corruption at the, in Australia. Look at the Royal Commission like into Mugabe. Banking right now. Look at the Royal Commission to Banking. So they're, they're charging dead people fees. They're, they're, they're charging fees for no service. They're, there's a myriad of things that, that we just think, oh, we, we shouldn't have that. But it's systemic. It's mm. going on everywhere. Uh, the, the point was, though, corruption was there. Corruption is here. And I thought to myself, I don't want my kids to be like the kids in Zimbabwe because they're starving. Uh, from a prosperous nation in just a few years. And if that happens here, I haven't looked after my kids. So let me find out what is the root cause of this corruption. And as I looked at that, I found it's a, a culture of, of greed and self-centeredness, a culture of maximizing self-interest at the expense of others, which permeated everywhere in the world. And we're actually taught it, whether inadvertently or on purpose. But we go to school, we go to university, tertiary and so on. We are taught to compete in the marketplace irrespective of the consequences. Recklessly, we want market share. And we don't care if we put our fellow Aussie out of business. We don't care if we inflict financial hardship onto that person, which in, in every state in the country, financial hardship is the biggest cause of domestic violence. So, and DV is the biggest cause of homelessness in women in every state in this nation, all stemming from the root cause of greed and self-centeredness. If we can change that, and in saying that, the whole, almost all social distress and human misery comes from that same root cause, economically, socially, politically. So if we deal with that root cause, we then start to stop the systemic poverty and the systemic distress, and then we can mop up the symptoms and mop up the water. So I built our business with a view to fixing that culture. I thought if I could build a big enough company as an immigrant into a country that I was looking at critically saying, wow, look at this place, we've beautiful place, we have to make sure it doesn't decline and deteriorate into a Zimbabwe mm. or a Venezuela. Yeah. Now that's why I built the business. And what is your business? I, I thought to myself, the way to do this, I have to learn how money works in this country. I need the money so that I can acquire, uh, so I can grow the business. Or, uh, uh, I didn't want to grow organically. I wanted to grow by acquisition. So we became a significant company very quickly so we could wield influence and money for, for initiatives. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we did that, and we did it by buying businesses in sectors of the economy that we thought were resistant to economic downturn. So, because we knew, as I learned to become a financier, and as I learned about money, and an international financier, I knew that there was unsustainable debt around the world and we were going to collapse mm. in 2008. So we shored all of that up by, by buying into sectors like energy, IT, water infrastructure, financial services, and so on. We're also in health and fitness, but that is not resistant to economic downturn. It's just my <laughs> wife's baby. We had a big health club and she loves it. It's a women's health club. If you were prime minister or if you were able to run the country, if you were supreme <laughs> leader for long enough to, to change three things yeah. about Australia, uh, in particular, what would they be? Well, this is going to shock a few people, but I would deal with three major issues. One of them is uh, water. One of them is immigration. And the other one is energy. Okay, and I think water can be dealt, uh, well, I, let's go to energy first. I think energy can be dealt with almost overnight, okay, because we're getting all these blackouts and we've got a whole lot of problems going on because we have this aversion to coal. We think that coal is going to trash the planet. However, coal is still the, the world's cheapest baseload energy source, mm. and we can clean coal up to 90%. In Japan today, coal, the new power stations, of which there are 725 now in operation, on 90% re reduced emissions, right. and it's still dirt cheap. Yep. Okay, through the Healy and, and the CCS uh, uh, um, systems, which yep. are basic stuff, we can do that. There's another 1,100 coming online in the Asia-Pacific Asia region, coal-fired power stations that are burning black Australian coal and, and uh, emitting very few emissions. Right. So I would do that. In water. Term, water, the, we live on a continent that is drying, physically drying, okay? Look at the Murray-Darling at the moment. We mm -hmm. are actually, and, and that, nothing to do with the floods in far north Queensland, the, the continent is drying. Uh, we also, we have such a small population here that, that our infrastructure costs so much and so on and so on. But if we think about it carefully and we create, we, we bring water into central Australia and there's lots of feasible ways of doing it. Some of them are not viable, 
doesn't matter if they're not viable because we should be driven by vision and not money, not profit. Viability comes second, vision comes first. So we should be driven by the vision of we need to green this continent. We need water in the centre of the continent. And that is quite easily done by uh, various methods, but the best one would be piping water from Papua New Guinea. There's, there are trillions of megalitres, of gigalitres in PNG Southern Highlands. And a Piping water from New Guinea? Yeah. It's been done, the, the, the feasibility wow. is done, Dave, and it's, it's a, we can bring that at the very least, incredible. yep, we can bring at the very least eight gigalitres. We're not even using day. the water we've got here in Australia. We're not using it wisely, no. Mm. That is actually feasible and viable. Yep. Okay. And it will bring eight gigalitres a and day. And why do we want to green the centre of Australia? This is the other thing, immigration. We cannot, we don't even have a domestic market. We, we, what, the reason Holden closes down in Adelaide, the reason all our manufacturing goes offshore, we don't have domestic markets. We rely heavily on a global market and we go to cheap labour sources, which is not a good thing because it encourages sweatshops, it encourages all the things that people who are thinking about caring and sharing in an economic sense should be working against. Okay? Mm. So essentially then, if we had, and, and this will trip up a lot of people, but if we had 70 million people living in this country, who were screened, I'm not saying crash our borders open, I'm saying we need like-minded people. Okay, like -minded Contributors, builders. Builders, so, so, so people, entrepreneurs, people of enterprise, mm. SME owners who want to come in, but I would have a school The kind of, of immigrants that came here in the first part of the 20th century. Sure, mm. sure. So th those folks that came in, whether black or white, okay, it's not a white Australia discussion, mm. it's more a case of are we like-minded yeah. and like- very interesting, um, very revolutionary ones I'd like to <laughs> probe further. We need new ideas. At another time. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, certainly worth having the discussion. Yeah. Tell me, if s there's anybody watching who's currently finishing school or finishing university mm. and about to head into the real world, what kind of advice would you give them? Advice that served you well, perhaps at the same point, or advice you wish you had have gotten uh, at the same point? Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's two things I would suggest. The first one would be do what you're good at, okay, because we're all good at stuff. We're actually in our DNA. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a reasonable teacher, unfortunately. I don't like public speaking, but I am. So I do that, okay, but I would be hopeless at managing a childcare and, and looking after babies because I'm not good at that. So do what you're good at because if it's in your DNA that you're good at it, singing, you know, leadership, whatever it might be, you will prosper in what you're good at and it'll be easier for you. And the second thing is more of a cultural thing and that would be make yourself so valuable to people that they can't do without you. And that includes even in your social interactions, even in your marriage, like my wife says to me, if you die, I'm coming with. I don't want to live in this world without you because I'm valuable to her. Like I do all the cooking, I make the beds, I do this. Sorry, man, it's just what I do because I don't <laughs> want her to do it because I love her. I want her to be relaxed when she comes home. I'm high energy, so I make myself so valuable to her that she just comes home and she can watch TV and chill out. She works hard here. She's managing 32 companies, the finances. So that's you make yourself so valuable to everybody even on facebook even socially business they can't do without you you will prosper you'll prosper wherever you go the business i had in perth was a motorcycle business and i knew they didn't like me because i was an employer and they're employees this is an unbelievably strange social divide in this country where as soon as you employ someone everybody hates you right yeah and so i looked at this and they hated me more because i was an immigrant and they, they, i could hear them calling me a refo a refugee <laughs> in the background in the workshop of my big motorcycle business. I thought, how do I fix this? How do I get so valuable to these guys? They love me. Mm. So I got them all together. I said, guys, what are your dreams? Because I'm already paying them way above the award because they were specialized Ducati people. I couldn't afford to lose them. And I wanted them to prosper. I said, what are your dreams? And they, they just said, we want you know this and that. And, I, and the funniest thing was they wanted to race motorbikes and beat the Japanese mark. These are Ducatis, Italian, European bikes. They wanted to beat the Japanese. And I said, is that your dreams? They all said, yes, we'd love to do that. So, okay, let's buy a bike. Let's hot it up. Let's take them on. Let's get out to Wanneroo in Perth and let's flog the Japanese. And so I did that. I pumped money into it. <laughs> yep. The Japanese bike shops, that is. Right, yeah. <laughs> and so we did that. And we started to win the Thunder Bike Series. And then we started to beat the Japanese bikes in the Formula One races. And my employees became so famous. They were in the media. Their self-esteem was up. They were so happy simply because they cared enough to work with their dreams. And they grew to love me. There's one of them still phones me 30 years later. This was in the early 1980s. Wow. Still phones me. Every, every milestone in my life, he phones me from Bunbury and W. That's awesome. Yeah. Very good advice and a very good success to be emulated. Thank you very much for sharing your story with us, David. You're very welcome, Dave. My pleasure.